Kia ora, tēnā koutou. That's hello, how are you from New Zealand. All my Kiwi Mopar fans that are in New Zealand, my 68 Dodge Charger is ready. Boom. They're coming to get you, Barbara. On this episode of Graveyard Cards, Will is tasked with a very unique paint job on our 1969 B5 Blue Plymouth GTX. Mark's not a big fan of it. And with help from George, Will makes rapid progress on our 1970 B7 Challenger RT 446 pack four speed. I have George out there. I'm trying to treat them better than Mark does. After years of work, Mark finally gets to take Raymond's 1968 Charger for a test drive. But will its owner arrive before Mark makes it back to the shop? Um, here to pick up my car. In Springfield, Oregon, Mark Warman, together with his skilled ghouls, bring classic Mopar muscle cars back from the dead to look like they did the moment they left the factory floor. We're off to a good start this week. I'm going to start on our GTX and get the little ghosting done on the bottom of the deck lid that says Graveyard Cars. Uh, so with our 1969 GTX, it's not an all original car. So we're kind of doing different features to it that makes it more comfortable for him. Uh, one of those features is he wanted to have our logo on the car. The whole car has been done. It's the last part I have to do. It's been pre-painted, had to fix a couple things, that's been done. So now I'm gonna paint the whole thing blue, let that get good and dry, then lay my stencils out that say Graveyard Cars Mark Warman, get that blue pearl put on it, peel it off, clear coat the whole thing, and then it'll be ready to go on. So since I got Mark's signatures, what I did is I had stamps made. So now I can just go write the checks out, stamp it. Mark's not even a check signer at this point. He's lost that ability because he gave me a signature to have recreated. So at this point, he's just, uh, he answers phones. He's not even a check signer anymore. But we'll cut all this part out. All right, good to go. Let's go get some paint. Uh, now that the deck lid's all masked up, we're gonna get painted. So we got the B5 blue all laid out on this and we are now ready to apply our stencil and get ready for the little Graveyard Cars logo. So as always at Graveyard Cars, we've got a busy week coming up. Will is doing some custom paint work on the deck lid of a 1969 Plymouth GTX. Now this is a cool little car. This is one of the very first Graveyard Dreams cars where you could come to Graveyard Cars and say, hey, I want a car, I want a 69 GTX, I want a B5 blue with white interior, and I can build that car for you. This was one of those cars. Will is painting on a ghost image of the Graveyard Cars logo and my signature on the deck lid. The other job for Will this week is our 1970 Dodge Challenger RT B7 blue, the original 383 four-speed that the owner wants to look exactly like a 446 pack four-speed. Now, it is a real RT, Will's got to grab George, go over and have him help put the fenders, the hood, the deck lid, all the sheet metal on it, give it its final dial in because it's ready to paint. His goal is to get it over ASAP into the assembly shop where we'll turn it over to the rest of the ghouls for final assembly. On my agenda is a 1968 Dodge Charger we took in a few years ago. Uh, it was a basket case. The guy had done the body and paint work himself, actually had a friend do it. Uh, did a really good job, but once the body and paint was done, he kind of ran out of his field of expertise, so he asked me to put the car together. The car is completely assembled. The only things left on this car are a final road test, which I need to do. I will do that while I'm taking the car out to have the air conditioning serviced in it. And I need to have all this done before the owner gets up here to take delivery of it. So stay tuned. Lots going on at Graveyard Cars. A 
About three years ago, Mr. Raymond called me up, had a 1968 Dodge Charger he had been working on. He had bought the car, him and his friend had done the body and paint work on it, began the reassembly. So him and I talked about it. I told him I wouldn't be responsible for the body and paint because I didn't do the body and paint. But in this particular case, I would help him by putting his car together. This is a 440 Magnum 375 horse automatic transmission out on our first test drive. Looking at my gas gauge, the next thing I'll need to do is hit the gas station, which is exactly what we had to do as kids in these cars. So it's uh, 1968 all over again. The only difference is it's not 20 cents a gallon now. I paint these cars apart in most cases. Uh, if it's a metallic, the doors will be on it, the fenders will be on it, but the hood and deck lid are off. So I just count how many coats I do and I make sure that I spray out of the same gallon. So I put the exact same amount of coats on here as I did the car. Uh, we're gonna do that little ghost graveyard cars image. Uh, the customer wanted it on there. Mark's not a big fan of it, but I think with the way this is gonna come out, he's actually gonna like it and uh, it's gonna look really classy on the car. All right, so these are our two stencils. We're gonna stick them on here, mask off the whole entire deck lid, throw a little color on it, unmask it, and we'll be clear it. You don't want it to be bright and stand out too much. So I just simply just took a nice blue pearl, laid a stencil out, got the graveyard cars on there. So it's a little subtle thing that you're not gonna see that much, but in the end, we'll look great. This car is exactly a graveyard uh, dreams car. This is a car that I went out and purchased specifically for the owner. He had reached out to me a few years ago and says, I'd love to have a 69 GTX, told me what all he wanted on it. So I went out and found a GTX that was actually a B5 blue car. He's putting power windows on this car. He's putting air conditioning in this car. He's putting things on it it never started life with. We're not making a fender tag to say all of a sudden it had all these things. The fender tag will tell you how the car started life. But when it comes to doing all the goofy painting and that stuff, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. But he was so proud of us doing the car for him that he talked me into letting we'll do the little logo there. And eh, it's all right, you know, it, it's okay. It's not my cup of tea. But he's, he's paying the bills and he can have what he wants. So while I'm applying the pearl, in between each coat, I just run constant air on it just to help dry it to kind of speed things up. When you do uh, the pearls and try to go stuff in, you don't see it that well in the booth. So when I had that lot tape uh, over the white spot, you could actually peel that back and see how far along your color's coming to know how many more coats you should do. I didn't do a spray out to say, hey, I need five coats exactly. So I have a good idea of what it needs. So that's just kind of a little cheat thing that I did. I peel that tape back, I see what the original white looks like, and then I know how many more coats I need to do approximately. So I got five or six coats on there right now. I think that's enough. You don't want it to be too gaudy. I mean, he did want it ghosted in there. So at this point, I should be able to go in there, unmask the whole thing, clear coat it, and we're done. So the guy that invented that whole thing about branding your stuff, well, I don't know if he invented it, but he was cool. If you had a George Barris car, he had a crest, the Barris crest. And you, he would, like if you bought one of his cars, it would come with that Barris crest on there. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be opposed to making a graveyard car's crest that you could put on there like with double-sided tape. And, and put it on and take it back off. I just wouldn't want to put anything on permanently. In the old days, they, the dealers, when they would sell a car, they actually would have this big chrome molding, this, this name plate, sorry, not a molding, and they would rivet it or screw it right into the deck lid of the car. I've got some out back that still have that great big writing, that, that big horrid looking piece of chrome on the back of their car that nowadays it's 50 years later and it's cool because that's where it started life at. But boy, driving around, it wasn't cool. Got the whole thing clear coated, came out beautiful. Can't wait to get this thing cut and buffed and moved outside so we can get a good look at it. Oh uh, yeah, so this is a great start to the week. Anytime you can come in and knock out a project or two in one day getting paint work done is a good start to the week. So now that this is done, once it's all bolted on there, we'll move on to the next project. Okay, we got our fuel back up. Um, I've got to drive this out to Eugene and have the air conditioning charged on it. Uh, we don't do that in house anymore. So this is a great chance to do a test drive and get a feel for the car. That's the camera boys over there driving a Hyundai Accent. I don't pay him very well. 
You should get a job that pays better. The box. Everybody that knows me knows I like to have fun with the employees. All right, I like to tease them a little bit. I don't pay a minimum wage, so they could certainly get a better car than a Hyundai. I think when you're talking about buying a Hyundai, you're talking choices. All right, and I'm not here to slime any other particular car, but I mean, he's a young guy, right? He's a single, and he's driving around in a Hyundai, right? That's just what I call a bad decision maker. Or not. Right now, I'm doing 70 miles an hour on the freeway. It feels good. It shifts at good points. It's tight. There's no vibration. I mean, this is really what it would have felt like in 1968, back in the day. Now, this does have steel belted radials on it versus the original bias fly. So I'm sure it drives a little better from that, too. Look at this, like they're doing something. Like, it, like they're doing something, you know? Hey, your grandma called. She wants her car back. Bye-bye. <laughs> that's, that's what I mean, you know. I just got out to the repair shop in Eugene. It's about a 10 mile drive. Everything worked great on the car. The track great, drove great. Everything working like it's supposed to. Uh, my mechanic, he's gonna go ahead and charge the air conditioning. As soon as that's done, we'll disconnect. I'll head back over to the shop and I think Kane's gonna be in this afternoon to take delivery of it. So, all good. There's no doubt Dodge was crazy in 1970 with some wild, bold options on their cars and colors. They could also be subtle and classy. The 70 Challenger RTSE is a great example of that. The 847 package, special edition, got you things from the factory that were standard that were considered to be more luxurious. And the code for that package is A47. With that A47 package, you automatically got the rear trim finish panel on the back of the car. You got your belt moldings, back edge of hood, back edge of fender molding. You got a formed headliner with an overhead consolette. The consolette had three warning lights in it that would come on. Low fuel, fastened seat belt, and door ajar. One of the most iconic features on the SC car was the small opera style back window. When these cars were built, between all of the luxury options that they had on them and all the outside styling, it made it a fast, and luxurious muscle car. In fact, one of the first Mopars I ever restored was a 70 Challenger RT SE 446 pack, four speed, A34 Super Track Pack, black, white bumblebee, and houndstooth interior. So, how is that for a clash of classy and muscle? That was the point behind the RT SE. And this is our corpse of the week. With the air conditioning topped off in the car and blowing ice cold like it's supposed to, I can take off, head back over to Springfield. Now, one of the things I wanna check for is shifting patterns. I wanna make sure that they're right. I wanna make sure we don't have vibrations when I take it up to high speed. Overall drivability of the car, just some last minute things. So right now the car feels really solid to me. As you can hear, it's idling good, it's in gear, it's idling at about 900 RPM, which is fine. It's an air conditioning car, so you need a few more RPMs. The exhaust sounds rich. I don't hear any exhaust leaks, which is really great. So I'm gonna take it down to first gear manual low and row through the gears. It's an automatic, so I'm just gonna wind it up a little. Here's second gear. Good solid shift and drive. And there you heard it go right into drive like it's supposed to. Everything working on it. Turn signal indicators. Our fuel gauge is working and accurate. Our temperature gauge working and accurate. Same with the oil pressure. I love it. Let go of the steering wheel. Tracking down the road, beautiful. So this is very successful. I'm excited. This is a great car. When you take into consideration the style of a 68 Charger, one of the most beautiful cars on the planet. And then that, it's just hard to argue with one of these cars. 
I'm gonna take it back, make sure we do a final wipe down, get the dust off of it, and then the owner will be in this afternoon. Another happy customer delivered. Gonna make everything good. So right now we're getting ready to start the kind of the final fit and finish on our 1970 B7 Dodge Challenger. Uh, it's just super important to make sure every nut bolt is in the correct spot, making sure your gaps are good. We put it on the bin pack to relieve some of the pressure that uh, to relieve the sag that happens sometimes when it's on a whirly jig. Uh, so with the Mente's car, it's one of the few that we've had here that they come in, is it running, driving? The car had been done in the 80s or 90s. Looked good, but wasn't quite up to our standard. So we brought the car in, and just like every other one, we dip them, start all over, and now he's got a nice, clean, all original uh, Challenger. So we get it up there, we relieve that pressure, and then just go around just fine tuning the whole thing because once it's everything set, it stays that way through the rest of the process. So when we take it off the bin pack, it will sag, but you have to trust in what you did before. So when you get the car painted, buffed out, and it's done, it looks great. It might be off a little bit, but once you put it over an assembly side and put it back on the bin pack where it's got more stability underneath it, all those gaps look great. We got our first fender hung. Everything looks good, double check, signed off on. So now it's time to move to the next. So we got the final fit and finish done on our 1970 Challenger. Everything came out just the way it should. So at this point, we're gonna roll it in the booth and get some color going on it. I am getting our database going. Um, we have a new system that we're moving all of, because we're, oh God, who is that? Hi. Hi. I'm here to pick up my car. My name is uh, Kane Raymond. I'm a chef. I've been chefing for 25 years now. Um, I did a bunch of TV shows. I was on No Kitchen Required. You maybe might have seen me on there. Chopped, uh, Food Fighters on NBC. I basically cook, man. That's what I love to do. Kane, oh, Martha. Hi, nice to meet you. How nice are you? Nice to meet you too. I'm good. good. Oh. What's going on? Uh, I, I came up to Graveyard Cars to pick up my uh, 1968 Dodge Charger that I've had uh, restored here. I didn't know you were going to be here today. Uh, Honestly. really? Honestly, yeah. So I hope my dad, does my dad know? Yeah, he's expecting me, I think. Yeah, I told him. Yeah, okay. I told him I was coming. Okay. Well, I think, I mean, I don't know. It's so hard to get a hold of that guy. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll go uh, hang out maybe with Will or something if, if that's cool. Yeah, we'll no, totally. Look at some cars and... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go, right. go awesome. and grab Will. He'll probably know All more right, what's cool. going on. Thank you. Hopefully. Yeah, You're nice welcome. To see you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet yeah. you too. Well, he's too young to have a car here. Earlier, we learned about the A47 package on the Dodge Challenger, the features that came standard on that particular model. Now, I didn't cover this, so I'm gonna put your Mopar knowledge to the test. What additional feature came as standard equipment on the A47? Was it pedal dress-up kit, power seat, speed control? Stay tuned after the break, we'll have the answer for you. All right, ghouls, how did you do on our trivia question? Did a SE A47 1970 Dodge Challenger come standard with speed control, power seat, pedal dress-up kit? If you guessed pedal dress-up kit, you are right. That is part of the SE package with the A47. Speed control was an option on it, and a power seat never existed in an E-body. So there you go. You learned a little more about the A47 Challenger SE. Uh, right now we have our 1970 B7 Dodge Challenger in the booth. We're trying to get this car done. It's supposed to be 100 degrees today. And being that it's a metallic, the sooner we can get it done, uh, when it's cooler outside, the metallic will lay out better. So I'm trying to hurry up, get it done, so that way we have a nice clean paint job in the end. This is the first time we've done a B7 car, uh, especially on a Challenger, so I'm excited to get it done and see how it comes out. This 
was kind of a rush job because once it hits 100 degrees, I just can't get that paint to lay down nice. So it was a little bit of a challenge to get it done on a shorter time frame. Uh, the color laid down great. We were able to beat the heat and get the clear coat done today. So I'll let that sit in there and then I'll start the cut and buff. Well, what's up, man? Nice to see you, man. How you been? You good? Yeah, everything's good. Here to, here to pick up the car, man. You excited? Yeah, yeah, it's time. It's time. It's only been a couple months. I mean, this car's really special uh, to me. You know, growing up in New Zealand, you know, I was always like loving America and you know, TV shows and stuff. You know, I used to watch Dukes of Hazard, and I was always like, oh my God, that car is. Well, actually, to be honest, I think I like Daisy a little bit more, but the car was like awesome. So you know, um, I fell in love with you know, ultimately um, the Steve McQueen movie. You know, bullet, and that's where I looked. I saw the charger, and I was like, "Man, this thing is just absolutely beautiful." That was really where my passion for Mopar really started. Wait, where the hell is he anyway? Please, I take I take your car uh, do the AC. Really? Yeah. I haven't even driven it yet. You haven't driven it ever? What the? <laughs> How's the paint? How's the body? Well, I mean, it looks great. Yeah. You know, I wish you would have let me paint it. Yeah. But. A good friend of mine in Sacramento, he's a body and paint guy. He uh, found the Charger. I've been looking for a car because I wanted one for myself. And uh, we took it to the stage uh, where he couldn't do anything, you know, anymore for the car. And, um, you know, I saw this, uh, heard about this guy, uh, Mark Warman in Graveyard Cars. And I was like, you know, he, he's got to be the guy to do it. You know, he's going to take it and, and make it perfect, take all the bits and pieces that need to be done correctly. So I got a hold of Mark. He was like, uh, who's, you know, who's this funny guy on the phone from Australia? And I was like, no, I'm from New Zealand. And we had a bit of a laugh and um, we organized him to come pick up the car. And the rest is history, man. It's like, it's here, I'm ready. Um, yeah, and he still kept thinking I was an Aussie. I had to keep telling him I was a Kiwi, but uh, that's all right. Well, whatever, I mean, that's yeah. fine. Next next one, next one. Oh, you can do another one? Yeah, when, when I win Lotto, man. Oh. All right, he'll be back soon or? Yeah, probably right. by now. Okay, and you're gonna do some barbecuing? Yeah, man, I wanna do it. I've, I brought some food, I wanna cook and give some food back to everybody for like making it happen for me. It's like a little give back, you know. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, cook you guys some food. Hopefully you won't get sick. All the barbecuers yeah. out All right, here. Dude, let's, let's do it. <laughs> It's a hot Saturday night, 1972, and you're going to A&W for the cruise in. You want to look cool, because we all did. So, which one of these beautiful, classic American Mopar muscle cars would you choose? A 1970 Super B, 446 pack, four speed, bench seat, V5 blue, or one of 1920 Plymouth Superbird Alpine white with a 440 and an automatic transmission. Now, for me, I always like the wing cars, but it's really hard to argue with the six pack. But it isn't about me. I want to hear if you make the call, which one would you drive? Go to Graveyard Cars right now and cast your vote next week live on Facebook. We'll announce the winner. So far, Will goes to the deck lid on our 1969 B5 Blue Plymouth GTX. Can't wait to get this thing cut and buffed and moved outside so we can get a good look at it. And the panels were hung on a 1970 B7 Challenger RT, allowing Will to finish final paint. The color laid down great. We were able to beat the heat. While Mark was out getting the air conditioning charged on the 1968 Charger RT, the owner, Kane Raymond, arrived at the shop and is anxiously awaiting its return. I didn't know you were going to be here today. Uh, Honestly. really? My granddaughter, Emma seven years old. She's the one that came up with this phrase. Everything's going to work out. And here we are. Awesome. One of the things about graveyard cars is we keep getting busier. How busy are you in the course of a day? So busy you can forget people are coming out. That's what happened with our CUDA. I pull up and here's the 71 CUDA. It's cool to see a 71 in any condition. I mean, they made 129 of those cars, the 446 barrel automatics. These folks bought it from the daughter of the original owner who bought it on December 21st, 1970. To have one that was in a garage 
to be able to go out and buy it in its last ran condition, which was as a race car. You can tell by the, how high it is in the back and you know that thing had some meats underneath it. The car started life as a B5 blue over a blue interior. Again, automatic on the floor, rally instrument cluster. Extremely beautiful car when it's done. By looking at the car, he did a lot of drag racing. Right now, currently under the hood is a 426 Hemi backed up with a Hemi four-speed transmission. That's not how this car started life. If it did, it'd be very, very rare, even rarer than it is. It started with a 446 throttle and an automatic transmission. Now they still have the automatic transmission. We unloaded that from the trailer. We have that, that's great. We can put the correct section in the floor. Perfect, all that stuff's great. The original motor, you can't make that happen. It's gone. I happen to have a G71 440 HP that is perfect for that car that I've been saving for a 71 that deserved it. And I've got that. So that'll be one of the transformation things we do in addition to the restoration is making it correct. The folks that own the car are really cool. They're retired federal prison guards. They don't want to sell the car or flip the car. A lot of guys open up a garage, you see a, a 446 Barracuda and you start seeing dollar signs. They don't care anything about that. They bought the car because they've always wanted it. And they want to restore it back to the way it was on the assembly line. And we're going to help them do that. The original fender tag is gone. So the guy who had the car and bought it new probably took the fender tag off, put it somewhere really, really safe. So I am going to get together and have Dave Weiss come out. We're going to document the car so that we have that. I want everything done as right as rain and I want as much documentation as possible. So when we're done and say it did or didn't have billboards, we know it. It did or didn't have disc brakes, we know it. All these things you can tell from the original DNA of the car once that car starts getting disassembled. Everybody's looking forward to working on the car because number one, it's such a nice body. It's gonna spend zero time in there with George. It should make it right out to the mudroom as soon as we get it back from the dipper. We worked on one of the 108 446 barrel four-speed Cudas Legends. That was our Phantom Cuda. Now we're gonna work on one of the 129 446 barrel automatics what we do. Huh? So I'm getting ready to head in the booth right now and start the cut and buff process on our 1970 calendar. I'm gonna start with 800, then I'm gonna go to 1200, 1500, 2000, then 3000. So the car's already been pretty much been cut, except it hasn't been done with 2000 yet. You can see it's still shiny through here because I stay off that line. So I do this just to protect it. Uh, challengers are a little more tricky because right, we got a real sharp style line where a CUDA doesn't. So you kind of got to watch that line. So a lot of times I'll just pass off the line when I do my sanding and buffing to ensure that we don't burn. So it's a little, it takes a little bit more time than some of the other cars, but the end result's the same. I mask up all the edges just because I don't want to burn it. Um, because once you burn it, then sometimes it can be challenging trying to fix it. So I just would rather be safe than sorry, make sure those edges are all protected, and then that way I don't have to fix anything later. If you catch the edge, whether it be when you're sanding it or with uh, the buffer, if you don't have those edges protected, you burn it. Because what that means is you actually sand off the three or four coats of clear coat, the however many coats of color that you have on there, and you can go right down to the primer. So you can have something that's actually an inch or two long, and it'll be primer underneath there. So you can literally take the paint off all the way down to primer on that. So that's why I just put the tape down to make sure I don't have any problems at all. All right, that should be enough. All right, folks, I got a good true or false question for you. This is gonna be a simple one if you're a Mopar nut. The A47 special edition package had a lot of neat stuff that came on these cars from the factory as part of that package. True or false, leather interior was one of those standard features. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. Okay, folks, how did you do on that one? On our Corpse of the Week, the 1970 Dodge Challenger RTSEA 47 car, the question was, leather interior. Was it standard equipment on that car? If you said false, well, you were wrong. Now, now this is a little bit on the tricky side. The leather front seat inserts were standard on all SE cars. However, you could change that out 
for one of the houndstooth interior patterns, one of the cloth seat patterns. So if you remember me talking about the 70 Challenger RT SC446 pack, four speed, super track pack, black car, white stripe, houndstooth interior, your answer lied in that. So I think I'm just rattling stuff off to be funny or cool or clever, which obviously I am all those. There's also knowledge in it, so. Knowledge is power. All right, talking about the difference between an original part and a replacement part. Now, if you're gonna try to find interior trim pieces, such as like a blue one that is original and is perfect, you're gonna pay a fortune for it. They're gonna be called NOS or really, really nice used. This is actually a nice piece, except for the fact that it suffers from what most of them do when you go to restore the car. And that is that they're old and they're brittle. So if you see the hole right here, you see that it's broken out a little bit. If you see right here where this line is, this had a garnish molding that went over it and it should go all the way to there and have a hole right there. That whole corner is broken out. Same thing down on this end. The ear that's supposed to come down and intersect with the kick panel is completely sheared off. So when you look at the two together, here is what that corner should look like and there is what it does look like. Down on the other end, this whole tail that comes off that you see here is gone and missing. This is a replica of the original. Now, this one's black, so you would be able to dye it the color of your interior when the time came. The main thing is that these are available because forever they weren't. And when you wanted to find an original one, you really paid through the nose if you could find one at all. So it's just another example of, in this case, if I had a mint condition set of original B5 blue interior 70 Challengers, I'd use it, but I don't. So what do I want to do? Put a broken one back in or a nice new one that's pliable, that won't break, dye it the right color, and go to the show. Now that the sanding is all done completely, I start the buffing process. I get all the dust, get the whole car wiped down so it's a nice, clean, fresh surface to start with. It was one of those things that has really sharp edges, so I made sure I went through the whole car, masked them up, went from 800 all the way out to 2000, and the finer grits in between, so that way when it came time to buff it, it really buffs quickly. I start with a wool pad, compound number one, and I use that wool pad over the whole car. It's the most aggressive, so it'll actually get the shine back a lot quicker than the other pad, but it also can give you the burns really quick. So that's why we just mask it off to make sure that we're good through that phase. So we start very aggressive with the wool pad before we move on to the next. These cars are a process. Uh, Mark is very meticulous, you know, on every nut and bolt has to be OE. If it's not OE, it's because a customer requested something else. But these cars take time. Trying to find qualified people to come in here and do what Mark and I ask is hard enough as it is. So right now I'm doing this by myself. So I have two weeks into getting that Challenger looking perfect to come over to assembly. But while I'm doing that, I have nobody else helping me currently out there in the shop. So you fall behind on stuff like this. So it's impossible to try to get a car done every episode. If you were to look at those cars done every episode a year later, they're not gonna look nearly as good as what we produce at a slower rate. The buffing process, like I said, it's kind of a tedious thing. So you just have to slow down, take your time, protect your edges like we always do. After that is done, I take it outside, give it a thorough wash, make sure all that compound is off completely because if you don't get it off, it'll dry in the cracks and crevices, making it very hard to get out later. One of the things I really wanted to do uh, when I came up here for not just Mark, but the whole team, you know, Will and Alyssa and George and everybody, you know, all the guys was, you know, really cook something for them. You know, when I did No Kitchen Required, we went into these indigenous cultures and we worked with these indigenous uh, people and they would cook for us and we would cook for them and we would sit around and we would eat together and we would laugh and talk and, you know, create stories, you know, and, and these memories and stories are really important to who I am, especially coming from New Zealand. It's part of my culture and, you know, I, I thought, what what better place to come up here and cook something for Mark and the team and feed them and be like, thanks, man, I really appreciate all your hard work. Um, 
let me do something for you, you know? Let's eat a meal together, let's talk, let's share some stories about what's, what's happened with the car and everything and, and come to this sort of, you know, this really cool place. I decided to do something pretty simple for everyone. You know, I was gonna make it like a really nice light uh, coleslaw. It isn't really heavy mayonnaise based. Um, it's like cabbage and carrots and onion and all these fresh vegetables that are raw uh, with, you know, mint and cilantro and all these fresh herbs. And I did some little Moroccan grilled uh, prawns. Shrimp, you know, Mark's always shrimp, mate. You know, I'm like, got this Australian accent going on. He cracks me up, but uh, again, I had to be like, Mark, I'm a Kiwi, man. Stop with the Australian So we did some really cool grilled shrimp on this wicked AMG grill. I mean, it, uh, it's on next level. I cannot believe it. I really actually want to get one. It's, it was awesome. So, um, so grilled prawns on top of that. And then I made a really nice little um, spicy uh, green onion and Japanese like mayo that goes on top. So, you know, it's like a little uh, sweet shrimp, a little spicy mayonnaise, and then this fresh salad on a brioche roll. It's like, it's a sandwich, but you know, it's like there's heart and soul in the food and you know, it's, it's it, man, it's it. Now that the wool pad process is 100% complete, I'm gonna grab George and roll the car out there. Normally I do the washing by myself, but on these hot days, that compound dries quick, the water dries quick. So I'll grab him to kind of tag team it and we can get the process done quicker. Have him wash, I'll rinse it all off. There's actually a way to do these cars so you don't have water spots, leftover compound and whatnot. So this is the first time I've ever had him help me. So this is good for him to be able to learn that so I can use him more in the future on these hot days. George finally started wearing shorts. He was tired of having legs that looked like corpses, so that's a new new thing for season 10. See, we're getting some color on those legs. George has come a long ways. Uh, you know, I think he's been with us for four years now. And when I didn't, we didn't even get along actually the first couple years, but he's really stuck it out and actually learned a lot. So he's kind of like my right hand guy when I need something or questions like something I don't even know. Um, I usually go to him with everything for help around the shop. Um, even though it's hot, you don't have to worry about it burning the paint. I don't get that close to the panel and we're kind of just a good once over because George has went through and pretty much done all the leg work already. So you're really not sitting on one spot just running it on there. It's kind of an overall wash. See, when I was a kid, I used to wash these cars and then Mark would stand here and he'd make sure I was soaked by the time it was all over. So I'm a much better teacher than uh, Mark ever was. George isn't all wet. I'm not making a mess out of him. I got to be honest, I appreciate that. You're welcome. He would make me hold the seat belt out and then he would run that pressure washer right up to my hand, which would totally soak me. And then sometimes it'd be funny to hit my hand, which that hurts. So now that we have our own teams and I got my own guys, I'm not gonna go with the path that Mark does. I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. You're right I did! So I have George out there with me. We washed the car, I didn't soak him. I'm trying to treat them better than Mark does. So Mark believes in really beating them down and then bringing them back up so they could really appreciate being down. So with my team, I just try to, right now they're, the, they're like the D team. And because they all showed up this week, I've moved them up to a D plus. So in my way, it's very easy for them to rise quicker. And then by doing that, they also take better care of me in the long run. Uh, back in the old days, I used to bicker with everybody here. Uh-oh. Hey boss. Give him a hard time, because I used to go the same path as Mark. But now I don't go his path anymore. Did you get a name tag, George? Uh-oh. Yep. Now we're all about, you know, keeping people higher, build morale, keep them in a good mood all the time. That way they perform better. George and I did a great job. He did a great job. It's pretty basic on what you have to do. You just have to be thorough. The car is completely washed, looks great, rolled back into the booth, chamois down and ready for the next process. We've already done the paint work. The cut and buff is done. It's all been washed up and it's completely spotless now. Now is the time where we go in, mask the car up completely and then start the undercoat process. Not every car gets undercoated. The ones that we do were factory done already. So we just make sure we always replicate that. It's nice to have it on there because it does quiet the noise down a little bit. Um, I don't put it on as heavy as the factory does. So I like it to look a little bit cleaner so you can see the quality of repairs we've done when it comes to putting in floor pans and whatnot. But it's a quick process, um, prevents you know the underside of the car getting beat up. And we do it to almost every car here. I like the undercoating. I think it looks great and it does serve a purpose. Uh, if it was my car particularly, I would want to paint it, but not the factory gray. I would like to see the underside of the car painted just as good as the outside of the car. 
The undercoating is actually a very quick process. We have a great setup. It allows you to go in there once the car is masked up and just spray. So it's just the most important thing is to make sure you get in all the cracks and crevices, cover the whole entire thing. It takes about 20 minutes to do, and it does take a good week or two to actually fully dry. The car looks amazing. The undercoat went perfect as usual. So I'll give that about 30 minutes to kind of dry a little bit, unmask the car completely, and roll it over to the assembly shop. You know, Mark was busy, interruptions all day, pretty much like normal. That's why the rest of us team have to kind of carry it because he's really not out here working. But he was able to get the reveal done. And from what I hear, Raymond was super happy with the car. Now it's time to go eat lunch. Okay, come on in, lunch is ready. Let's do this. Oh, look at there. Ooh. Look at that. You know, at the end of the day, I think that what we're doing is a good thing for everybody across the board that owns these cars. But I think it's also sparking a lot of memories and imagination of days that have gone by or days that could come. In the case of Kane Raymond, I think it's days that are gonna come. He's a pretty young guy, so he's looking forward to many years of having fun on that thing. Uh, he made us a really great lunch. Fantastic lunch, that was cool. Well, listen, thank you so much for, for coming out. If I eat any more, I'm gonna blow up. Yeah, Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. You're a good guy. Thank you. Good guy. Yeah. I don't think Will you, you know, the, the car's taken three and a half years. It was worth the wait. This car is unfreaking believable. I mean, it is, you know, the words just sort of disappear. I love this car, man. I have this connection, this emotional connection to the car like I do with food, and it is gorgeous. Unbelievable. Miela, I love you. I wish you I can't wait to bring this car home and we can go for a drive and we can pick up your girlfriends and tear it up and down the street at 40 miles an hour. So you're safe. Hey, we had a great week at Graveyard Cars. Things went well. I'm surprised Will was able to do all the things that was on his wish list. He got our ghost imaging done on the deck lid of the 1969 GTX. It looks really good. I think the owner's gonna love it. We'll also manage to work with George on getting all the sheet metal hung on the 70 Challenger RT, 383 originally, now a 446 pack four speed car. Once that was done, Will was able to do the final block and paint work. B7 blue is a gorgeous color. Once the paintwork was done, Will did the undercoating on it, moved it over to the assembly shop so the ghouls can start bolting that car together. The folks with the 1971 Cuda, showed up, V5 blue car. This is an all original, super solid, real life V-code, one of 129 446 barrel automatic cars. So all in all, we had a really nice week. The capper for the week, of course, was Mr. Kane coming out. It's always fun when you get to deliver a car to a client. It's a beautiful, nice, pretty original little 68 charger. So with that, the car is delivered, the owner is happy, everything is working great. We're looking forward to next week. See you guys next week. We've got a great episode coming up. Meanwhile, I am on my way home to sit at my little outdoor fire, barbecue me up a couple of steaks, have some Diet Coke because I don't drink, and get rested for next week. <laughs>